The top business stories live from the Sky News City studio. A warning from the World Bank that the global economy is set for its slowest half decade of growth in 30 years. Shares of Boeing fall again as two US airlines say they found loose bolts on some of their 737 MAX jets. Plus a boost for the electric vehicle market as Polestar reports a big rise in UK sales for last year. I'll be joined by the chief executive. Good afternoon, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. The global economy is set for its slowest half decade of growth for 30 years. That's according to the World Bank's latest Global Economic Prospects report. Thanks largely to the strength of the US economy, it says the risk of a global recession has receded. But it predicts that glowing political tensions could create near new near-term hazards for the world economy. Well, joining me now is Ayman Mancoza. He's the chief deputy chief economist at the World Bank. Uh, I'm and welcome to you. Um, you're predicting a slowdown in G global GDP growth from 2.6% to 2.4% this year. What are the underpinning assumptions there? So this is going to be the third year of slowing growth for the global economy. Um, we will see advanced economies slowing, slowing significantly because of elevated interest rates. And of course, in the case of China, uh, there is slowdown. So the main engines of the global economy are slowing. Uh, we have seen remarkable resilience so far over the past two years. But sooner or later, you know, the ongoing and lagged impact of these high interest rates going to be felt. And we think that, uh, that we are uh, feeling the impact of these high interest rates. Obviously, uh, interest rates are expected to fall this year, certainly in the United States and the Eurozone. Um, has that not had any bearing on your forecasts? Yes, uh, interest rates will come down, but ultimately we need to look at, you know, real interest rates, so the inflation-adjusted interest rates. Even though um, interest rates are going to come down and inflation will come down throughout the year, we think that the real rates are going to remain elevated. And let's not forget, we have record high debt levels around the world. It's going to take time to sort out the challenges confronting the global economy. What would you say the main risks to your forecasts were? And are they to the upside or the downside? Uh, I think there are three main risks uh, on the downside. The number one is uh, geopolitical tensions. The Russian invasion of Ukraine, in, uh, of course, to Europe. Uh, you have a major conflict in the Middle East escalation of these conflicts could have significant implications. The second uh, main risk is the possibility of financial stress because of high debt levels and high real rates. And the third one is the slowdown in China. We might see weaker than expected growth in China that could have significant implications. Having said all of these, I think there is an upside risk here. The US economy can surprise on the upside as it has done over the past year, uh, remarkable growth we saw in the U.S., uh, close to 2.5%. Uh, the labor market is still uh, robust and the inflation is coming down without having, you know, significant decline in activity. If that happens, all the better. We might see higher growth. You note that the recent uh, events in the Middle East have to date had a muted impact on commodity prices so far. Do, do you expect that to remain the case? Uh, we do expect that the, the, that is going to be the case. Uh, but given the conflict now, you know, tensions in the Suez Canal, and of course, uh, you have, you know, Panama Canal, the water levels uh, being low, um, we are seeing significant challenges uh, the, the, in the main um, throughways when it comes to global trade. And if the conflict in the Middle East escalates, that could have implications for energy prices, and for inflation and for economic growth. Now, you've published forecasts for the United States, the Eurozone, for Japan, for China, for a lot of major economies around the world, but not the United Kingdom. Why not? United Kingdom is, uh, is, a, is a country we monitor. It is part of uh, advanced uh, economy group. We have a forecast for advanced economies. Of course, the, the, the World Bank focuses on emerging market developing economies. This report is 90 to 95 percent 
all about emerging developing economies. And when we think about, you know, the big uh, advanced economies, we are focusing on the, the, the US, Euro area and Japan. OK, good to see you, sir, this afternoon. I must apologise. I, I mispronounced your first name, by the way, earlier on. It's I, Ihan, of course. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Some other business news stories for you now. And two US airlines, United Airlines and Alaska Airlines, have discovered loose parts on Boeing 737 MAX 9 jets that they have inspected after one of the planes suffered a mid-air blowout last Friday. United, the biggest single customer for the MAX 9, said it had found instances that appear to relate to installation issues in the door plug, such as bolts that needed additional tightening. The news came as investigators at the National Transportation Safety Board in the US said the incident on Friday involving an Alaska Airlines jet happened because an emergency exercise door plug blew out at around 16,000 feet after moving off stops designed to keep it attached to the plane. Well, shares of Boeing, which lost 8% of their value on Monday, are currently off by just over 1% this afternoon. There you go, that's how the share price is looking right now. UK jugs giant GlaxoSmithKline, GSK, has agreed to pay up to US$1.4 billion US dollars for a biopharmaceutical company that was only founded last year. Iolos Bio, which is based in London and San Francisco, seeks to address the treatment needs of patients with respiratory and inflammatory conditions. Its main asset is an antibody used to treat severe asthma, licensed from a Chinese biotech company, which is set to enter phase two clinical trials. GSK will make an upfront payment of $1 billion and a further up to $400 million when the treatment passes certain regulatory milestones. The variety discount retailer B&M is to pay shareholders a special dividend after reporting better-than-expected Christmas sales. B&M, which currently trades from 717 UK stores and a further 453 in France, said group sales in the 13 weeks to the 23rd of December were up by 5% to £1.65 billion on a year earlier. It said like-for-like -like sales in the UK, which is, of course, the measure that strips out the impact of new store openings and refurbishments, were up 1.2% during the 14 weeks to the 30th of December. It said it was on track to open 76 new stores in the current financial year, including 45 in the UK. The shares are up 1% right now. Now, if you were watching our morning edition last Friday, you will have seen us reporting that growth in the number of electric vehicles sold as a proportion of the total UK market slipped slightly last year. But that doesn't mean makers of electric cars are necessarily struggling. Polestar, which is owned by Volvo Cars of Sweden and its former Chinese parent Geely, said today it sold 12,543 cars in the UK in 2023, and that was up 70% on its sales in 2022. Well, joining me now is Jonathan Goodman, he's chief executive of Polestar in the UK. Jonathan, welcome to you. What drove this sales growth? Was it better availability? Oh, no, I think good availability, a product that was the right place at the right time, creating interest in the brand. And we've seen that interest be growing over the last three years. So I think it was the, the, the right car at the right time. We're still very, very strong demand for, 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 e, for EVs in the UK. So very, very pleasing year for us. Do you think you've been taking market share in the, in the EV sector of the market? And, and if so, who from? Yeah, well, we've taken, you know, we're, we're taking 4% of the uh, market. I think we're taking it from some of the traditional manufacturers. Um, and I think that as more choice comes in, uh, then the people are actually looking and, at new brands such as ourselves and saying there's a real opportunity to try something different. And I think if your cars look right and the appeal is there, it, it works. But above all, it's about that demand that we're seeing grow, albeit that it was fairly static in, in, in 2023. Did you have to cut prices at all to tickle up demand? No, I think we, what we've seen is uh, demand in the business market, the company car driver, has been very strong with the benefits that are provided by benefit in kind taxation. More difficult year on retail, and I think that that's one of the challenges that we have going forward, is that whilst we now have a glide path to go forward as an industry towards that 100% EV adoption by 2035, what we're not seeing is the incentives in place for the retail customer so that they can actually join the party as well. Well, quite. How unhelpful was it for you that the government pushed back the uh, target for phasing out new petrol and diesel vehicles by five years? Um, listen, I think the government's provided clarity now as to what the glide path is. What that doesn't change is that by 2030, 80% of the industry has to be electric vehicle. But 
I think now, having put in place the glide path, having put in place the penalties, and that's up to £15,000 a car, what now needs to happen is people need to look at, well, how can we actually stimulate the market a little bit? And, you know, the reality is the UK does less for the retail customer in terms of incentive than any other market in Europe, and I think that's got to change. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I think that... There are some really simple things that can be done, you know, and I think the SMMT have called for it, which is halving of, um, the halving of VAT, to bring that down to 10%, give someone a real positive rationale. If I go to France, I'm €4,000 a car. If I go to Ireland, it's €3,500 a car. And if I'm in England, it's next to nothing. So something like halving VAT is, is, is one option that they can have, look at. The other option for the EV drivers at the moment is to say, well, why don't we make charging cheaper? You know, charging is cheap for all the people that have a home charger, where I pay 5% VAT on it. Why not put that 5% VAT on the outdoor charging, where an awful lot of people are forced to go? Yeah, it does seem very odd, doesn't it? I mean, you've just started offering um, cheap uh, charging uh, uh, availability, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've got a, a time with Omi and Octopus, and I think that's part and parcel of what the industry is doing. I mean, I think... It's an exciting time for the industry. You've got a plethora of new products to, that are going to be launched next year by a range of manufacturers, so the choice will never have been better. We're going to launch two cars next year. What we now need is the government to just come on board, look at how they can give that little stimulus, no one's asking for a huge amount, little stimulus to the private buyer and say, do you know what, now's the time to charge. We know from our experience and talking to customers, they're ready to change. A little bit of stimulus, and I think we'll have a very dynamic year next year for EVs in the UK. So what sort of sales are you targeting? Yeah, we're going to see the growth continue. I mean, we launch two brand-new SUVs next year on top of the Polestar 2, which has driven our sales so far. Those SUVs will give us a real growth opportunity in the fastest-growing segments of the market. So we never put a figure on it, because I always think that's a little bit dangerous. You're then beholden to it. But we see a strong growth for Polestar in 2024 as well. All right, well, we'll look forward to finding out. Jonathan, good to see you this afternoon. Thank you. Now, last year was a very disappointing one for flotations on the London stock market. But one company that has flagged its intention to come to market early this year is the alternative energy investor Greenhouse Capital. The company, which is currently part of the oil and gas producer Molecular Energies, is expected to list before the end of March. It currently owns four businesses, including dual fuel, which retrofits heavy goods vehicles and barges to run on both hydrogen and diesel. I've been speaking with its chief executive, Chris Raggett. The London capital markets have traditionally been a very strong supporter of growing businesses and ambitious businesses, and we certainly fit that mould. So we want to avail ourselves of the opportunity to, A, raise capital, obviously, as a growing company, that's what we need, but also to generate a sustainable, um, supportive shareholder base that will help us as we grow and as we go on the journey to get bigger. So what sort of sums are you looking to raise? Uh, we're initially looking at a very modest raise of around three and a half million, but up to 10 million, because if you ask any CEO, they've always got use for capital. We're certainly no different to that. Um, but very modest to begin with, um, and that will get all of our businesses off the ground and get us into a really sustainable, profitable mode. And what sort of stake will molecular energies retain in the business going forward? Molecular energies will come down to be less than 50%. Right. What, what's the timetable on this? End, end of... Q1, I think you've said so far. Yeah, we're looking to the end of Q1. We think the market's fertile at the moment. You know, people have come back from the New Year break. Typically, asset managers start allocating capital towards the end of January, and that's when we'll be looking to market. So I've mentioned uh, dual fuel there, which is obviously uh, one of the main portfolio companies. Mm. How quickly do you think the business is going to be able to commercialise its IP? Very quickly. Um, so it's innovative and proprietary technology. Importantly, we own it. Um, we had some testing results that were announced in December that show that we can displace up to 31% of hydrogen in a diesel HGV, which is exactly the number we are looking for. So we're very pleased with those results. And we've already identified um, our initial customers out in Paraguay. Now, you might ask, why Paraguay? Um, it's a landlocked country, has 75,000 HGVs, the world's third largest barge fleet. So, again, a very fertile environment for us to start our retrofitting programme, which we think we can get off the ground very, very quickly after the IPO. Is barges going to be the main application for this rather than heavy goods vehicles? Initially, we're targeting heavy goods vehicles because that's where the testing's been done so far, but there's no doubt that this can be applied to the barge fleet as well, which we will look at very quickly in, in time. There's been a good deal of scepticism around hydrogen-fueled vehicles. What do you put mm. that down to? Two things. 
I'm very sorry we're having to break into that uh, interview. Hopefully we can bring you the remainder of that later, but we're crossing live to Washington, D.C. Now, the former President Donald Trump is holding a news conference following a court hearing. Is the special counsel conceded that if it was President Obama who was being prosecuted for a drone strike, then they'd have to consider immunity. But when it's not, when it's President Trump, then they're taking the position that there's no immunity for presidential acts that were required when a president is carrying out his job responsibilities. If we adopt what the special counsel wants, if we adopt what President Biden wants, then we open the Pandora's box to political prosecution after political prosecution after political prosecution. In fact, Joe Biden could be prosecuted for trying to stop this man from becoming the next president of the United States. We don't need political prosecutions. We need political process. I'd like to introduce President Trump. Well, I want to thank you all. And we had a, I a very momentous day in terms of what was learned and what they've conceded. They conceded two major points that were they were right in doing it. I don't think they had much of a choice, but they're very, very big, very powerful points. And I think we're doing very well. I think it's very unfair when a opponent, a political opponent, is prosecuted by the DOJ, by Biden's DOJ. Uh, so they're losing in every poll. They're losing in almost every demographic. Uh, numbers came out today that are uh, really very mind-boggling if you happen to be Joe Biden, and I think they feel this is the way they're going to try and win, and that's not the way it goes. That will be bedlam in the country. It's a very bad thing. It's a very bad precedent. As we said, it's the opening of a Pandora's box, and that's a very, that's a very sad thing that's happened with this whole situation. Uh, when they talk about uh, threat to democracy, that's your real threat to democracy. And I feel that as a president, you have to have immunity. Very simple. And if you don't, as an example, if uh, this case were lost on immunity and I did nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong, I'm working for the country and I worked on uh, very hard on voter fraud because we have to have free elections. We have to have strong borders. We have to have free elections. Those two things almost above all. And we found tremendous voter fraud. We have a list of it. We have some findings if you want it. The press doesn't like reporting it, but we found tremendous voter fraud determinative voter fraud. But we worked on that. That's what I was doing. And uh, they were talking about after. Well, nothing has to do with after I left. It was during the time. And that was what they really focused on today during the appeal. And they concede that, and everybody concedes that. And if it's during the time, you have absolute immunity. So uh, we'll see how it all works out. Uh, we have. Uh, a great argument. We have an argument with they conceded two major points today. In fact, I think it's probably a concession to have to ask the lawyers, Todd, if you'd like to talk about it. But they conceded two points that I think were, uh, by normal standards, if it weren't me, that would be the end of this case. But sometimes they look at me differently than they look upon others, and that's very bad for our country. Uh, you had a very big event yesterday, as you saw, in Georgia, where the district attorney is totally compromised. The case has to be dropped. Uh, they went after, I guess, 18 or 20 people. They wanted to go after a lot of other people. They wanted to go after senators. She was out of her mind. Now it turns out that that case is totally compromised. In fact, they say she's in far more criminal liability than any of the people she's looking at. So I think that when you look at what happened, where. They pay a lawyer with absolutely no experience, $700,000, who happens to be her lover or her boyfriend. And uh, then they go on trips and vacations together, very expensive vacations together. And the reason they paid him so much, because he was after me. Because this way they can afford to pay him a lot more, probably passes a certain test. And that's a very sad thing that happened in Georgia. And I would imagine that case is going to be dropped. Every legal analyst that I've spoken to, every legal analyst that I've read have said that case is so compromised now it has to be dropped. Uh, very good people were 
very badly hurt by that case. It's a shame. Very good people. People did nothing wrong. Uh, they did nothing different than what Democrats have been doing for years and years and years, whether it's slates or anything else that you're talking about. But they were very hurt, and it turns out that uh, she profited tremendously in that case. It's illegal. What she did is illegal. So we'll let the state handle that. But what a, uh, what a sad situation it is. I want to thank everybody for the fairness. We've been covered very fairly. Most people agree that uh, we're entitled as a president to immunity. If you didn't have immunity, as an example, uh, Joe Biden with the prosecutor, we're not going to give you a billion dollars unless you get rid of the prosecutor that's after, that's after the company or his son or whoever it is they're after. But he wanted that prosecutor gone, and he's on tape saying it. Or you could say the horrible job he's done at the border where our country is being destroyed, or the horrible situation that took place. The lowest moment, I think, in the history of our country was Afghanistan, the way we withdrew. Not that we withdrew, but the way we withdrew. With, with shame, we surrendered. Uh, people killed, 13 great soldiers killed, many unbelievably, horrifically hurt wounded, hurt, and hundreds of people died on both sides. Hundreds of people died. He could be prosecuted for that. So you can't have a president uh, without immunity. You have to have, as a president, you have to be able to do your job. But if this didn't work out, if I wasn't given immunity, then other presidents, when we talked about today, uh, President Obama with the drone strikes, which were very bad, uh, they were mistakes, terrible mistakes. Uh, you can't put a, uh, you really can't put a president in that position. So I think most people understand it, and we feel very confident that eventually, uh, hopefully at this level, but eventually we win. A president has to have immunity. And the other thing is, I did nothing wrong. We did nothing wrong. Uh, the investigation of the election, which was a rigged election, everybody knows it. And just if you just look at, they didn't use state legislatures and. They didn't, uh, they went to the FBI, and you look at FBI and Twitter, the Twitter files with the FBI, all of the horrible things, uh, FISA, the FISA court, the signed documents, uh, the lying to Congress, and the stuffing of the ballot bo boxes, all on tape. Stuffing of ballot boxes, all on tape. Government tape. And most of the information, as you know, we'll give you some of the findings that just came out, but all of that information, as you know, was gotten from mostly government sources, government tapes, government files, and government stats. So it's uh, very sad when something like that happens. You know, you wouldn't have inflation, but much more importantly, you wouldn't have had the Ukraine situation with Russia. You wouldn't have had the attack on Israel. You'd have a much different economy right now. You'd have a great economy. and. We would be respected all over the world the way we were just three years ago. So I want to thank everybody very much, and we, uh, we think we had a very good day today. And the concession of these two major points was pretty amazing, and uh, honestly, I'm very glad they did it. I think they did the right thing. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. President, you just used the word bedlam. Will you tell your supporters now? That was Donald Trump. Uh, he's just been appearing in court uh, in uh, Washington. He's... Uh, Speaking to the appeal court there, and that is in an attempt to uh, overturn uh, a case that uh, has been brought against him for trying to overturn the 2020 election. More on that throughout the afternoon here on Sky News. Here are the markets. Well, European stocks traded to the downside this afternoon as government bond yields have firmed with investors rowing back on bets for the timing of interest rate cuts this year. All the main indices lower this afternoon in mainland Europe. Volkswagen's a talking point. It's off three quarters of one percent, despite annual sales last year returning to be close to their pre-pandemic high. Here in London, the FTSE 100 has also finished lower, down a tenth of 1%. Also, the mining heavyweights have dragged on the index. Hikma Pharmaceuticals is leading blue chip gainers after making a big presentation to US investors. That's up one and three quarter percent. While Glaxo is up by a similar amount after its by pharma acquisition has been well received. To the downside, JD Sports is off another four percent or so. The broker downgrades are coming through after last week's profits warning. Outside the FTSE 100, the staffing group Hayes is off by seven percent. That's after a profit 
its warning this morning. Its rivals, Page Group, uh, is off 3%. Robert Walters, 8% in sympathy. Elsewhere, the fund manager, Jupiter, is off 14% after reporting client outflows of £1.1 billion for the final three months of the year, while the house builder, MJ Gleeson, is off 7.5% following a trading update. On Wall Street, all of the main indices have opened lower after yesterday's solid performance, but Juniper Networks is up 21% on reports that Hewlett Packard is looking to buy the network products maker Boeing, as I mentioned earlier, currently off another 1%. On the FX markets, pretty quiet this afternoon. The pound has slipped against the dollar but remains close to a five-month high, off a quarter of 1% right now. As for the oil price, it staged a partial rally after yesterday's heavy sell-off. Barrel of Brent crude currently changing hands at $77.82 a barrel. That's up two and a quarter percent on the session. That's it from me. I'm back with Business Live at half past 11 tomorrow morning. Hope to see you then. In the meantime, stay tuned. Up next, it's the News Hour with Mark Austin. Thanks for watching today. Cheerio.